I'm here to introduce this panel and the members of the panel uh, for this program which we've entitled Baseball Heroes of World War II. The five players are Bob Feller, Tommy Henrik, Buck O'Neill, Burt Shepard, and Warren Spahn. And they are all in Washington today, November 11th, 2000, for the groundbreaking for the World War II Memorial on the National Mall, and to be honored at the World War II Veterans Committee's third annual awards banquet. Serving as moderator for this program is Gene Pell, former broadcaster and anchor for NBC Television, and formerly director of The Voice of America. Joining Gene as panelists are Bill Gilbert, author of 18 books, including six on baseball, and Bob Linder, a professor at Kansas State University. At this time, I will turn the program over to Gene Pell. Thank you, uh, Jim, and thank all of you gentlemen for joining us on this suspicious occasion on Veterans Day 2000. Uh, having just come from a very moving ceremony on the Mall here in Washington, D.C., uh, where everyone witnessed the uh, President of the United States, among others, in the groundbreaking ceremony for the World War II Memorial, which uh, finally, after all of these many years, is going to be built. But we're here to talk uh, baseball as well as World War II today. And as Jim mentioned, uh, Bill Gilbert is the author of a number of books on the subject. And uh, Bill, I'm going to start with you to give us a little context on uh, the war and the game during that particular time. Yes, sir. I'd be happy to, Gene. The, uh, both baseball and, and the baseball players made significant contributions to, to our success in World War II. The sport ex ex itself continued uh, at the urging of President Roosevelt, who considered it a morale booster for the home front and also for the men and women in uniform. And uh, so he gave what is called the green light to allow baseball to continue during the war. Um, but beyond that, the men who had made the sport great before the war also made unique contributions of their own. More than 500 Major League Baseball players served in the military during World War II, along with 4,000 minor leaguers uh, and members of the Negro Leagues. Uh, the, first, the first one to go in, significantly enough, was Hugh Mulcahy, who was a pitcher for the uh, Philadelphia Phillies and was inducted in uh, March of 1941. And I think his reaction is significant and representative of of virtually all of the players. Instead of being bitter about it, he said, uh, I don't think this year of Army life will hamper my pitching. Personally, I think this conscription bill, and he meant the military draft, is, is a great thing for the young men of today. Now, that, that's hard to imagine today, but here is a professional athlete losing prime years out of his career, but he was, he was going cheerfully. Uh, he thought he'd be back in a year, and he was probably influenced by a hit song from 1941 called Goodbye, Dear, I'll Be Back in a Year. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hugh Mulcahy was not back in a year, and neither was anybody else. Uh, he missed almost five full seasons. He was 27 when he left, and he was uh, 32 when he, when he came back in uh, 1945. Bob Feller didn't even have to go to war, and he lost uh, four seasons because of World War II. Uh, he was deferred because he was the sole support of his family with his father dying of cancer. Uh, he was supporting his father, his mother, and his kid sister Marguerite. But he went anyhow uh, two days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, gave up a brilliant pitching career even though he was still only 20, 23 years old. Had just turned 23 the, uh, the month before Pearl Harbor. But, uh, but he went anyhow because that was the American attitude in those years and that was Bob Feller's attitude. He also didn't have to go to gunnery school. He could have just taught physical fitness his whole or, uh, Navy service. But he applied for gunnery school, served as the, uh, the chief of a 24-man gun crew on the battleship Alabama in the North Atlantic, uh, North Atlantic and then in the Pacific, and uh, participated in eight invasions, including Iwo Jima, some of the bloodiest battles in the Pacific, and Bob was in them, and he, he, he now is the proud recipient of eight battle stars for his participation in those invasions. He came back and didn't miss a step in 1945, in August of 45. He struck out the first batter he faced, uh, won the first game he pitched, and in 1946, it wasn't a Yankee, was it? 46, no, it was not a Yankee. <laughs> it, was, it, was Jim, it was Johnny Outlaw, wasn't that the, the hitter that you struck out, Bob? Jimmy, first, Outlaw. Jimmy Outlaw. Jimmy Outlaw. Jimmy, yeah. Yeah, the first. <laughs> thank you, Tom Henrik. <laughs> Anyhow, he went on to a career of 266 wins, including three no-hitters and 12 one-hitters. 
And for all you Nolan Ryan fans out there, his fastball was clocked at 107 miles an hour. Uh, he was elected to the Hall of Fame in 1962, and no wonder, and seven years later was uh, chosen as the greatest living right-handed pitcher in the history of baseball. And sitting right next to him on the panel today is a man who is the winningest left-handed pitcher in the history of baseball. That's Warren Spahn. Uh, he lost three years uh, due to Army service in World War II. He was in one of the most famous battles, the Battle of the Bulge. He was also a member of the forces that captured the Remagen Bridge and shortened the war in Europe by, by many months. Uh, received a battlefield commission uh, as a lieutenant and was also awarded the Purple Heart uh, after being wounded in action. He returned uh, to win 20 or more games 13 times in his career, and as we all know, winning 20 games is the pitcher's hallmark of excellence. And Warren Spahn achieved that 13 times, even after losing three years due to Army service. He was a member of the National League All-Star team seven times, and holds the record, the man could hit, holds the record for the most home runs in the National League by pitcher, with 35. I went for years rooting for the Washington Senators without ever having anybody on the team who hit 35. And I think there were, I think there were some years when the whole team didn't hit 35. And, and Warren Spahn was elected to the Hall of Fame, and richly so, uh, in 1973. Uh, now, Luke Appling was a player who went in during the war, uh, and right after winning the American League Batting Championship, he, he went into the Army uh, very, very willingly posed with a big smile on his face, trying on army, army, an army helmet in basic training. And his wife might have summed up not only his attitude, but a lot of, the attitude of a lot of Americans. She said, the, the war will soon be over because outside of baseball, Luke never held a job more than two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> While all this was going on, um, we on the home front were, were adapting to a, a dramatically different way of life. Uh, rationing was, was imposed immediately. Uh, what, what food uh, and all the articles uh, were not rationed, weren't, weren't available anyhow. Um, it was very difficult to get many things, including such basic things as, as a typewriter for your secretary. Uh, even coffins were hard to find because, uh, because the metal was used for the war ever to manufacture planes and things like that. I can remember going, going in and buying toothpaste uh, for, for my family. Uh, my mom, mom would send me to the store and one of the items was, was toothpaste. You had to turn in your old tube before they'd sell you a new one. I mean, that, that's, how, that's how strict life was. No new cars were manufactured after 1942 until the war was over. We had air raid drills um, for that inevitability uh, that we were afraid might be an inevitability of uh, 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 bombing raids by uh, Germany or Japan. Germany on the East Coast, Japan on the West Coast. In baseball, if you went to a baseball game and you caught a foul ball, you threw it back. Unlike today, it's hard to imagine today. In those days, you threw it back onto the field because you knew that the ball would be sent along with other foul balls and, and used bats to our men in uniform, both here and, and overseas, if we could get them over there. And if you tried to pocket a foul ball, uh, you did so at, your, at, uh, at considerable personal risk because you'd be booed right out of the ballpark. Nobody kept a foul ball during World War II. We had victory gardens everywhere. We had scrap drives. Kate Smith single-handedly raised um, $600 million in war bonds by singing God Bless America and some of her other songs. And that was the life that we were leading at home while these people were giving up everything, these great baseball players, and marching off to war. Buck O'Neill was another one. He was the first baseman in the Negro Leagues for 12 years, mostly for the Kansas City Monarchs, was an all-star twice, uh, played in the Negro Leagues World Series twice, with a, a combined batting average of 341 against World Series competition. That ain't, that ain't bad. He entered the, uh, the Navy after the 1943 season at age 32, missed all of 44 and 45, returned and played five more years, retired in 1950 with a 292 lifetime batting average. And many of us remember him from the Ken Burns uh, series on public television on baseball and he remains today one of the great goodwill ambassadors for, for the sport.